Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon in some locations. Uh, I'm first of all going to completely breach my kind invitation by giving a different title to my talk uh, in order to make myself more up to date. So the full title of my talk is Heath Robinson, Ruby Goldberg, and Hans Roydy Giger meet Arendt Leipart, a guide to institutional layering in and over Northern Ireland. It's a hard act to follow Monica because Monica is not an act. Um, what I intend to do is to give you a political science guide to contemporary Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm assuming that some of you know everything and that some of you are only beginning on this particular subject. Heath Robinson, for those of you who don't know, was a famous English cartoonist whose special uh, skill was making uh, simple things uh, look incredibly complicated. This graphic shows uh, doubling the size of Gloucester cheeses by the Gruyere method. His American counterpart is Ruby Goldberg. Here I illustrate uh, his self-operating napkin. Like Heath Robinson, he thought about uh, how to design comical, complex machinery in order to do very simple things. And you're absolutely right. That's the, my intended metaphor for contemporary Northern Ireland. The protocol, which I'll discuss, is incredibly complex machinery in order to do a very simple thing block a hard border on the island of Ireland, and in addition, protect the existing rights regime on the island of Ireland. My third strange figure is H.R. Uh, Giger, whose museum in uh, Gruyere in Switzerland, no relationship to the previous reference to Gruyere cheese, uh, I strongly recommend to you. He is the probably best known to the young among you as the designer of the alien in the famous movie of the same name. H.R. Geiger's particular skill was creating extraordinary fusions of the biological and the mechanical. And yes, you're right. That's exactly how I think of the proposals for alternative technological solutions to the Irish border. These are absurd proposals that involve the complex fusion of the biological and the technological. But we'll get to there in due course. My theme is straightforward. We now have two agreements regarding Northern Ireland overlaid by two further new agreements. The uh, 1998 Good Friday Agreement was obviously a, a constitutional pact. It was uh, absolutely cemented in the British-Irish Agreement, a treaty uh, ratified in the same year, in, excuse me, in the subsequent year in Irish law. Those two major agreements now have layered on top of them the 2019 Withdrawal Agreement, in which the UK seceded from the European Union, and that includes the protocol, wrongly called the Northern Ireland Protocol, it's the Ireland-Northern Ireland Protocol, I'll just refer to it as the protocol. And in addition, there is now the agreement on the EU and UK trade and uh, cooperation. That is not yet ratified by the European Parliament, that's important to note, because it's possible that it may, might in fact fail to come into existence, even though it is currently being implemented on both sides of the EU and UK border. Now, why does all this matter? The life expectancy of a constitution is an interesting question. According to Zachary Elkins and his colleagues, the average life of a constitution across the world, a national constitution, is 19 years and two months. By those standards, the Good Friday Agreement has done very well. It's uh, just uh, passed into adulthood. Uh, it's roughly uh, 21 years uh, of, of age. That length of time for a constitution is exactly the same as that prescribed by Thomas Jefferson in 1789. I don't think he said that just because he wasn't at Philadelphia during the making of the American Constitution. He thought it was important that constitutional renewal should take place every couple of decades. So what was the 1998 agreement? Uh, at the risk of being tedious, it was fundamentally a consociational agreement characterized by four principles, parity or equality among the principal partners, proportionality, 
cultural autonomy and self-government in matters of fundamental importance to the relevant communities, and lastly, a set of veto rights preventing majoritarian dom dominance. In addition, the uh, internal consociational arrangements for Northern Ireland were matched by a North-South Ministerial Council linking North and South, and two sets of arrangements in East-West relations. The British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference, the successor to the Anglo-Irish Conference uh, agreed under the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 1985, and the British-Irish Council, linking all the devolved governments, the Channel Isles and the Isle of Man, together with the Government of Ireland. I'm not going to discuss, partly because I imagine Monica has done it uh, very well, uh, all of the peace process uh, elements that were linked to this political settlement, namely decommissioning, disbanding, police reform, and so on. Though all of them, together with the power sharing arrangements, had the ending of conflict as a central objective. Let's look at each of these arrangements in turn and to see what changes have occurred with, within them and address the question of whether they're, they are for the long term or whether they might conceivably uh, disappear under contemporary pressure. In 1998, the parties agreed that there would be a, a double premiership, a first minister and a deputy first minister who would be equally powerful, preside over the Northern, Northern Ireland cabinet. The only difference between them would be their titles. Ministries in the cabinet would be allocated in accordance with party strengths, according to a specific rule, the de Hunt rule, which I'll articulate in a moment. The core idea here was that no party could be excluded from the executive, parties in effect would control ministries and collective responsibility for everything would necessarily be somewhat limited. The special arrangements that existed in Northern Ireland included a pledge of office rather than an oath of office. No oath is required for ministers. They don't have to pledge their loyalty to Her Majesty and her successors. The most important feature of this arrangement was that it was intended to ensure that each side could veto the other's choice of first minister. They would be collectively elected on a joint pact, which meant that they had to put forward people who were acceptable to the other side. To match the arrangements in the executive, committees were also to be organized on the Dahan principle with the special feature that usually somebody from another bloc uh, and always from another party would chair the relevant committee facing the relevant minister. So that's the core uh, feature of the power sharing executive. Where did this model come from? Fundamentally from uh, the dual premiership came from an agreement between the SDLP and the Ulster Unionists, uh, a novel act of institutional design. Um, what this solution uh, created was its own problem. What would happen if the two parties that had made it were displaced in terms of ascendancy within their respective unionist and nationalist blocs. It was clear very early on, for example, that if the DUP became dominant, they would, among the unionist bloc, they would refuse to nominate Martin McGuinness. Uh, Sinn Féin appeared to be more willing to nominate Paisley, but to put it mildly, they weren't going to be comfortable with that uh, particular possibility. The institutional solution to this difficulty arrived in the St. Andrews Agreement of 2006, made uh, at the uh, famous university in Scotland. And this produced a second model of the dual premiership. Under this uh, set of arrangements, the nominating officer of the largest political party of the largest political designation shall nominate a member of the assembly to be the first minister. And the nominating officer of the largest political party of the second largest political designation shall nominate a member of the assembly to be the deputy first minister. In addition to these changes, there were some minor ones which allowed for the possibility of substitutes, uh, which were uh, subsequently, these provisions were subsequently employed when Peter Robinson had to briefly retire uh, from office while scandals related to his wife were investigated. And while Martin McGuinness conducted 
to the unsuccessful campaign to be president of Ireland, he was replaced by John O'Dowd. What these new amendments had the effect of doing were what was to now, uh, in effect, create something very similar to the Dehont rule for the election of the first two ministers. Um, namely, it would be in accordance, roughly speaking, with party strength. The rules also were modified to allow for the possibility of another coming first or second. That's my partial answer to um, Monica's question, the fate of the others. The rules now mean that if the others come in second place as a, as a designation, then the largest party in that block would uh, get the appropriate uh, first ministership. There are, of course, problems ahead in uh, the working and functioning of the Northern Ireland executive. The first and most obvious problem is that unionists are currently uh, deeply split between the DUP, the Ulster Unionist Party, and the traditional unionist voice, which appears to be making some significant inroads into the DUP. And it's conceivable that jointly they could fail to be the largest designation, which would mean for the first time that unionists would not hold the symbolically significant post of first minister. At the same time, it is conceivable, given the recent strength of the others as a result of European questions, that the Alliance Party could become the second largest party in Northern Ireland, or even the largest party. I don't think there's evidence for that yet, but uh, there's obviously strong support and renewal in that uh, quarter. But I don't think uh, the others are going to be uh, either the first or second place designation overall. If they were to become so, then they would win one of the, the premierships. All of these complex arrangements are embedded in a power sharing agreement. And the golden rule here in the view of Christopher McCrudden and myself is that these arrangements are best modified and amended and unwound by the parties themselves. And action should not unilaterally be taken by the two governments or by the courts to amend them. What's the Dehont process? Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, this is a simple illustration taken from 1999. On the top row, you can see the major political parties in Northern Ireland, uh, the Unionist parties in orange, the Alliance party in yellow. Um, it's in alliance with the Liberal Democrats in the UK and the Nationalist parties in green. You can see that in this particular uh, election, the Ulster Unionists had 28. Uh, the DUP 20, Alliance 6, the SDLP 24, and Sinn Féin 18 members of the Legislative Assembly. The Dehont rule works as follows. The largest party gets the first uh, ministerial portfolio, and its seat share is then divided by two. So the Ulster Unionists get the first ministry, and 28 divided by two, even for those of you who are afraid of maths, is very obviously 14. And this process of sequential allocation of ministerial portfolios goes on until the 10 ministries are all filled. And if you look at the bottom row, this produces a, a nicely proportional result. Three ministries for the Ulster Unionists, three for the SDLP, two for the DUP, two for Sinn Féin. That can't be guaranteed. There have been variations in the outcome. Uh, but what this produces is an easy mechanism of filling an executive that might otherwise be inescapably uh, delayed by protracted inter-party bargaining, both over whom is to be in the coalition government and which ministerial portfolios they're going to take. That part of the institutional design of the Good Friday Agreement has worked very well so far, and my simple message would be, don't mess with this part of the executive. Where did this idea come from? Uh, there were intellectuals who argued it at various junctures. Probably the first person to mention it was Richard Rose. But fundamentally, I believe it came from the institutional workings of the European Parliament, where both the DUP and the SDLP and the Austrian Unionists had been represented at various junctures. 
The de Hondt rule is used for committee allocation in the European Parliament, and that was imitated for the running of the Northern Ireland Executive and its committees. In terms of party interests, the Ulster Unionists first put this idea on the agenda during the Brook inter-party talks of the early 90s. There, the Ulster Unionists wanted to avoid power sharing, but conceded their willingness to accept the principle of proportionality. Later, they would accept both. The special joy of the de Hondt principle is that it allows the formation of an inclusive cabinet and gives no vetoes to other parties over who is entitled to be in the executive. The parties do have to sign up to a platform of democratic principles and conduct, and they can be found individually in violation of such pledges, but that requires a cross-community consent resolution of the assembly as a whole. So that's the power-sharing executive. Proportionality principles apply throughout uh, the new Northern Ireland over the last two decades. The single transferable vote system is used to elect the Northern Ireland Assembly, restoring the original model of the Good Friday Agreement, excuse me, of the Government of Ireland Act of 1920, and restoring to uh, the minority community in Northern Ireland a, an institutional feature that was intended to protect them against majoritarian dominance. We've just seen that the de Hondt rule is used to uh, allocate the executive and committee places. In addition, the de Hondt rule is used to allocate half the policing board. The rest are nominated by the first minister and the deputy first minister. Proportionality goes beyond political institutions. The agreement envisaged a transformation of the judiciary, which has worked. The uh, Northern Ireland High Court has, uh, in fact, a majority of cultural Catholics. Policing has been radically reformed as a result of the Patton Report, not as radical a reform as some of us would have liked, but the proportion of cultural Catholics in the uh, new Northern Ireland Police Service is radically more extensive than that which used to exist in the old Royal Ulster Constabulary. Special features of Northern Ireland's proportionality arrangements include the allocation of, uh, sorry, the, the guarantee of fair employment according to proportions, both in the public and in the private sectors. And that, uh, that employment rule, um, mandated by the Fair Employment Act of 1989, has been very, very successful. There is one feature of proportionality which so far unionists object to. They are not willing to see the Ministry of Justice created after the dev devolution of judicial and policing powers to Northern Ireland in 2010. They're not willing to see that portfolio in the hands of a nationalist, either the SDLP or Sinn Féin. So a compromise workaround has been agreed. Roughly speaking, what happens is that the others are in charge of the Ministry of Justice, uh, mostly the Alliance Party, but it's also been held by a person from a party that is now defunct, Northern Ireland 21. So that's proportionality. In terms of cultural autonomy and equality, the most important consociational feature in Northern Ireland is the existence of parallel education. Up until 1992, there had not been equality in funding for various uh, forms of primary and secondary education. Since 1992, that has been the case, and the Good Friday Agreement made no amendments in this respect. So Catholics, Protestants, and those who want their children to have integrated education all receive, uh, in principle, identical capital and salary funding. The Good Friday Agreement promised some transformations in the position of Irish and Welsh, excuse me, Irish and Ulster Scots. Uh, Irish was roughly speaking to be treated the way Welsh is in um, the principality. That has certainly not uh, transpired. And there were a range of other commissions established to achieve the equality of individuals as well as uh, the equality of the core communities. There are uh, features of the arrangements in Northern Ireland which strike observers as illiberal. Uh, 
You are required to register in the assembly as nationalist, unionist, or other. So self-determination is constrained. It's quite clear that these rules were designed in order to make power sharing work. They were not designed, I think, in order to exclude the others. It's not that their votes don't matter. It's that their votes aren't usually pivotal. And obviously, if the others grow in size, the uh, fairness of those rules will come under increasing pressure. And that's something we can expect possibly in, in the future. The last consociational feature of Northern Ireland's arrangements are veto rights. These are evident in the cross-community consent decision procedures inside the Northern Ireland Par uh, Assembly. One of those is a concurrent majority rule. Nationalists and unionists, as well as the majority overall, have to agree. The other is a weighted majority rule. 60% of the Assembly have to agree, of which 40% have to be nationalists and 40% have to be unionists. On the basis of a petition of 30 members of the Assembly, originally there were 108 members of the Assembly, any matter can be invoked to be subject to a cross-community consent resolution. And that often works like uh, activity in the US Senate to, in effect, delay uh, the passage of a measure that might otherwise have simple majority support in the Assembly. All of these arrangements have been protected by Northern Ireland's courts, as well as UK courts which have worked to treat the Good Friday Agreement in effect as a constitutional statute, or at least its uh, Northern Ireland uh, enactment the, in the Northern Ireland Act of 1998. Those are the core uh, veto right provisions inside the agreement. There are some special arrangements in the Good Friday Agreement. Unfortunately, these have not taken a statutory form of a strong kind. In the original thinking of those who made the agreement, they had in mind the possibility of what was called a swing constitution. There was no sexual connotation here. What was envisaged was if Northern Ireland voted to become part of the Republic of Ireland, then the rights embedded in Northern Ireland arrangements would transfer into the Republic of Ireland. That thinking was present, that thinking is evident in the text of the Good Friday Agreement, but it has nowhere taken a strong statutory form. So we do not have uh, what was sketched in the Good Friday Agreement as a double protection model, namely the protection of a group, whether it is a majority or a minority. There are other measures in the Good Friday Agreement to protect micro minorities, uh, those who are insufficient, uh, to win any electoral representation in the Assembly or insufficiently strong to get representation in the Cabinet. Those are largely legal rights rather than political rights, though a civil society forum was created with uh, mixed success. The most important contemporary uh, Feature of these arrangements, uh, feature of these arrangements that we reflect upon in contemporary times, is that the parties agreed a rule on the change of sovereignty, and it's my view that had this rule not been there, there would have been no agreement. And the rule is very straightforward. It suggests that if fifty percent plus one of the population of Northern Ireland vote in a referendum for Irish unification, it will take place, providing there's a matching democratic consent process in the Republic of Ireland. The odd feature of this arrangement is that the initiative for any referendum lies with the UK Secretary of State, who should uh, take action for a referendum if there is objective evidence of a shift in public opinion. What's unusual about the Northern Ireland arrangements is that in principle, there can be a referendum every seven years. It's also important to emphasize that Northern Ireland has no legal right of independence and there's no provision for joint sovereignty. One way of thinking about these arrangements is that Northern Ireland was intended to be a federacy. A federacy is a political entity with a special federal style relationship with the relevant political center. What makes the relationship federal in character is that neither side can unilaterally alter the constitutional powers of the other. Uh, 
And that was the intended model of the Good Friday Agreement, that Northern Ireland would be autonomous inside the UK. It would have devolved functions. In those functions, power sharing would operate. And in principle, neither the UK nor the Irish governments would intervene or modify anything regarding that settlement unless the parties in Northern Ireland themselves agreed to such modifications. It's important to recognize that the agreement did not generalize the notion of consent. Dev devolved powers were subject to power sharing arrangements. Non-devolved functions were not, such as the currency, uh, such as, very importantly, the single market and the customs union. So unionists absolutely mislead the public and everyone else when they suggest that the protocol violates the Good Friday Agreement. It does not, because the core functions of the protocol were those held by the uh, Westminster government. So that's a brief sketch of the institutional arrangements of the Good Friday Agreement. I hope you can see why I say that they're consociational in character. These arrangements have not, as I've already indicated, remained stable over time. There were difficulties getting the institutions to work, to put it mildly. At various junctures, both uh, a First Minister and a Deputy First Minister wielded a very extraordinary power, a resignation power, which automatically precipitated the loss of office of their partner within six weeks, if there was not some new arrangement agreed and would trigger a fresh Northern Ireland Assembly election. That power was used both by the SDLP and the Ulster Unionist incumbents of these positions. The dual premiership in effect became a lightning rod for spreading fire rather than for controlling relationships between the communities, which was not was what was intended. I suggest no malevolence on the part of anybody, but this is what was the unintended consequence of institutional design. The federacy possibilities were damaged when Peter Mandelson unilaterally suspended the institutions of the Northern Ireland Assembly and thereby the North-South Ministerial Council without the consent of the Government of Ireland and thereby breaking the treaty between Ireland and the United Kingdom. Breaking international law is not a recent British habit. It's a long established tradition for those of you familiar with the notion of perfidious Albion. What really is dramatically different about the constitutional arrangements in Northern Ireland is that after 2005, the parties on the hard line of each community, the DUP and Sinn Féin, came to dominate government. And I describe this with others as the process of the tribunes becoming consuls. For a decade, this institutional arrangement worked with relative tranquility. Uh, I don't want to suggest that the implementation of all the provisions of the Good Friday Agreement or the implementation of all the arrangements uh, ancillary to it have been successful, but there was institutional stability for about a decade. And partly in consequence, the British and Irish governments retreated from their oversight responsibilities. The Conservatives and Fine Gael, in effect, agreed to mothball the British and Irish Intergovernmental Conference. Uh, and they did so to appease the Democratic Unionist Party. And the result has been that they didn't maintain their own institutionalized pattern of cooperation, which would have stood them in good stead in recent times and would stand them in good stead now. In 2016 and 2017, we had two very different elections to the Northern Ireland Assembly. Even though the magnitudes of change look small by comparative terms, uh, in Northern Ireland, they were transformative. The turnout in the 2016 elections was just over 50%, uh, a shockingly low turnout or evidence of the stabilization and tranquility introduced by the political settlement. In 2017, the following year, the turnout was up by 18% to roughly 65% uh, of the electorate. And in that election, as everyone knows, um, Sinn Féin came within a whisker of defeating the Democratic Unionist Parties for Democratic Unionist Party for first place. What these elections had in common 
was the demonstration that Northern Ireland is now structured in three blocks, nationalist, unionist, and other, with some fluctuation uh, across blocks. What obviously transformed matters was the 2016 UK referendum to leave the European Union. In that uh, referendum, the overwhelming preponderance of Northern Ireland parties, including the Ulster Unionist Party, were in favour of remaining in the European Union. The DUP famously was in favour of leaving. So this referendum, I think, has had transformative consequences, both obviously for the UK and the European Union, and for internal relationships inside Northern Ireland. Brexit is an extremely irritating name because it presupposes that the name of the United Kingdom is synonymous with Britain. It isn't. There are British people in Northern Ireland, but Northern Ireland is not British. Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. The difficulty with the UK's decision to vote to leave the European Union was that for the first time, there would be a land border between the European Union and the United Kingdom. And it looked as if that border was going to be destined to be on the land border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. As we all know, that is not the case. The protocol eventually ag agreed has in effect placed the customs union and regulatory border in the North Channel and the Irish Sea. And in effect, therefore, what we've had is Brexit, the withdrawal of Great Britain from the single market and the customs union, but Northern Ireland has remained in the single market of the European Union and inside de facto its customs union. But I get ahead of myself. Look at the outcome of the UK referendum in 2016 to remind ourselves. You can see uh, clearly that the outcome was driven by the preponderant nation, the English, uh, whose 15 million votes in favour of leave uh, turned out to be decisive. But you'll notice that in Northern Ireland, uh, the uh, majority was clearly in favour, 56% of remaining. If you look at the uh, constituency map, you'll see that uh, Western Northern Ireland and Southern Northern Ireland, all the areas next to the border with the Republic, voted solidly in favour of remaining. So did North Down, uh, an ultra-unionist constituency, historically, uh, though having significant numbers of liberal unionists, and um, parts of Belfast also voted significantly to remain, though there was uh, different differentiated results. When this vote took place, the key question was, what would it mean for Northern Ireland if the UK left the European Union? Leaving the institutions was easy to understand, if not uh, welcome to those of us who are pro-European. It meant leaving the Council, the Council of Ministers, the Parliament, the Court of Justice, and so on. But did the UK have to leave the Economic Union? It had not been clear that that was the unambiguous message of the Leave side, but quite quickly voices were raised on the UK side that they, the UK should leave both the customs union and the single market. That involved, in terms of the uh, leaving the customs union, it would mean that the uh, European Union would have to have an external customs tariff barrier uh, against the rest of the world, which would now include the UK, and it would include regulatory barriers. Likewise, if the UK left the single market and refused the four freedoms of the European Union, it would mean that there would have to be regulatory checks on the passage of goods, though not persons. Initially, Theresa May looked as if she was intent on leaving all of the institutions and the customs union and the single market. And that looked as if we'd get a, a, that meant that we'd get a hard border on the island of Ireland. It did not transpire that way for all sorts of complex reasons, which you will be delighted to know I do not intend to take you through, um, partly because uh, immediate farces and tragedy are um, all in common consciousness. But what did happen was that, in effect, the EU took over the negotiations on the UK's departure. It said the agenda is 
You must agree on citizens' rights, you must agree on paying your bill, and you must settle the Irish border question, actually the EU's border with the UK. We have to remind ourselves why that border was so controversial. It was controversial because partition itself had been contested and controversial in 1920. It was accompanied by a failed boundary commission that had been uh, pledged as likely to lead to significant transformations in the border. That did not happen. Uh, the partition process of 1920 had led to significant damage, particularly in the uh, border counties economies. And as everyone who's Irish knows, the border has no obvious geographical or um, economic or watershed or even ethnic rationale. It's a, it's a function of a political decision, six counties that were sufficient to give um, Ulster Protestants and Ulster Unionists a two to one majority for the foreseeable future. There are an enormous number of roads across uh, this uh, particular part of Ireland, more roads than exist from outside the EU going into the EU in Eastern and Central Europe. Therefore, it's a very difficult border to close, though that had happened during the height of the conflict. This is, um, for those of you familiar, uh, evidence of uh, rival views on where the partition line should have been if there was to be a partition in the 1920s. The border, however, remained as it was, uh, lacking any clear geographic, economic, uh, or physical rationale. That's the border that people had to contemplate. Now, most of us know that this border had a, a, a very contested history. It was uh, the site of military conflict between 56 and 61, albeit on a much lower scale than what happened um, after 1969. That border used to require the, issu the issuing of passes uh, for people in the border counties to cross back and forth between various jurisdictions. A lot of the border was dug up and fortified and access prevented, particularly in conveniencing uh, border communities. Uh, this saga, this sad saga, is relatively well known. As a result of the Good Friday Agreement and as a result of conjoint membership of the European Union, that border became history. The the fact that both Ireland and the UK were in the common market meant, and in the same customs union, meant after the implementation of the single market program, that there was absolutely no need for any regulatory checks on the border. And given that the UK and Ireland already had a common travel agreement, there was no migratory or mobility blockage to free movement of people across the island. What the Good Friday Agreement delivered on top was the end of significant political violence and therefore the absence of any need to securitize the border. That's why uh, things now look as they do. The only evidence of you shifting from one jurisdiction to another is the signs change from kilometers to miles, depending, of course, on which direction you're, you're traveling in. So if we briefly go back to the UK's options, if the UK decided on a hard exit that implied a hard border somewhere, if the UK was interested in a soft exit, then it would have to think about the institutional consequences of that, both for itself and for Northern Ireland. If the UK stayed in the customs union, there would have to be regulatory checks on goods coming into the UK from the EU and vice versa. If the UK stayed in the single market, there would have to be regulatory alignment with the European Union so-called vassalage, which uh, proved unacceptable to most conservatives. What eventually came on the agenda were differentiated options, treating Great Britain and Northern Ireland differently. And th that's produced the outcome that we now call the protocol. The protocol did have a competitor for a while, namely the idea of alternative arrangements that would obviate the need for a strong level of physical uh, infrastructure. Uh, 
So what was called for was technology that would be able to check the movement of all goods and agricultural products, know their legal compliance, uh, be able to establish the precise, precise proportion of origins of the relevant components of the relevant goods so that they could meet rules of origins requirements, that uh, all the sanitary and phytosanitary inspection procedures uh, were fully compliant, and that the relevant tax uh, had been applied or postponed. Now, plainly, that's an amazing enterprise. You need to fuse a unicorn with a customs post and with complex surveillance technology. Not surprisingly, that has not yet materialized, but do expect it to come back onto the agenda if people successfully destroy uh, the protocol. Mrs. May uh, learned in office that there were significant difficulties attached to all solutions, but she was defeated in her effort in effect to achieve a soft exit for the UK as a whole, partly because she made that uh, premised on the special needs for Northern Ireland, which proved unacceptable to the Conservatives. Now, I'm getting very close to the present and I'm getting close to my time limit. So I'll, I'll try and be concise in dealing with our current predicaments. There are serious difficulties right now in exporting to the UK from Ireland, and I mean sovereign Ireland. And these difficulties are going to apply in due course to Northern Ireland enterprises uh, exporting to the UK, even though they're supposed to have untrammeled, unfettered access. Before I discuss the three scenarios that are emerging in our current set of predicaments, I want to emphasize that it is untrue when people tell you that uh, there are no provisions on no hard border in the Good Friday Agreement, and there's no provisions on Europe in the Good Friday Agreement. It's untrue. The recital to the treaty between the UK and Ireland mentions their joint membership of the European Union. It was a tacit working assumption of all the parties to the Good Friday Agreement that they would be inside the European Union with beneficial consequences for the border and uh, north-south relationships and the border regions uh, if a political settlement were made. There are explicit provisions on the European Union attached to uh, the Strand 1 institutions and the Strand 2 institutions and specific references to European programs. So it's absolutely not true that the EU is not in the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, it's also uh, the case that the items that Monica referred to, the human rights provisions in the Good Friday Agreement, which are attached to the European Convention on Human Rights, which is a separate uh, body from uh, the European Union, they too are in the agreement. What we get in the departure of Theresa May and the arrival of Boris Johnson is the replacement of a slow learner by a serial liar. Uh, I say this quite objectively, Boris Johnson is a demonstrable, sustained, regular public liar. He assured unionists that uh, he would deal with their concerns and he would ensure that there were no blockages to trade between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. And he successfully fooled some of them. And he embarked upon a settlement with the European Union, which we now know as the protocol. And that's where we get back to Heath Robinson and Ruby Goldberg. This protocol could work. It's very precarious. Um, it could work, and it could work in such a way that Northern Ireland enjoyed the best of both worlds, access to both markets uh, and the continuation of its existing and successful peace and power sharing process. In, 19, sorry, in, in 2024, the Northern Ireland Assembly gets an opportunity to vote on it, and if it's working, they can vote uh, to keep it in place. If all this worked out, Northern Ireland, in effect, would be a double federacy. It would have its existing special status inside the United Kingdom, and it would have special status as being a site of joint EU and UK authority 
as regards certain single market uh, regulatory arrangements and as regards customs infrastructure. Brendan, uh, apologies for interrupting, but you're just coming up to time, um, just to let you know. Okay, I have about uh, five or six minutes to go. The Good Friday Agreement is reinforced in all its parts according to the logic and text of the protocol. We shall have to see. The question before us is whether the Good Friday Agreement can sustain and bear these new layers. It's quite clear that unionists and loyalists are now rejecting the protocol. Some are threatening. Some are threatening to use violence. So far, violence has not been enacted. The Democratic Unionist Party is in full electoral panic mode, uh, believing it will lose support both to the UUP the alliance and uh, to the traditional unionist voice. If they were to be successful in their effort to have the protocol scrapped, I think that would bring down the power sharing institutions in the North. The SDLP and Sinn Féin would stand in the election competition for the Northern Ireland Assembly, but likely refuse to work the institutions because of the uh, likely re-erection of a, of a hard border. We have to ask ourselves, what is the British government up to? Is it acting ideologically on behalf of unionists? It seems very difficult to believe that that is the uh, explanation for Boris Johnson's conduct. He might be uh, he might believe that he's engaging in hard bargaining with the EU and will extract concessions from them. But so far, that particular stratagem does not appear to have been very successful. Is he, by contrast, intent on uh, breaking the withdrawal agreement and breaking the trade and cooperation agreement and taking the UK into trading on World Trade Organization terms. It's possible. If he's that risk-minded, that, that will produce very disastrous economic consequences for the UK on top of what the UK is already facing. It's possible that's what they're doing. It's possible they don't actually know what they're strategically doing. But what we can say is that this scenario is one that might end up toppling the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement. There are, as a result of the complex interaction between the protocol and the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement, two simpler equilibria that make themselves attractive to parties, one nationalist and one unionist. The nationalist uh, solution is let's get rid of the complexities of the protocol by having Irish re reunification inside the European Union. That is legally possible, that is democratically possible, but there isn't currently the requisite level of support. It might happen by the end of the decade, but it's not there right now. Unionists also would prefer a simpler world. They'd like to scrap the protocol. They say they don't want to see a hard border. They'd like to have technological solutions to the Irish border. How sincere they are on that, uh, we have to question. What uh, I think we're faced with is whether scenario three, the breaking of the protocol, will precede scenario two, Irish unification inside the European Union. If so, it'll be much messier. It would obviously be much better if scenario two occurs after the protocol is successful. But that I certainly can't guarantee to you. I'm obviously giving a warning that in my view, I think the Good Friday Agreement is seriously jeopardized by unfolding consequences. Uh, and I'd like to conclude by giving you a premier league table of treaties inspired by uh, the book, I am the Irish border, so I am. So here we have four treaties, the Good Friday Agreement, Versailles, Maastricht, the withdrawal agreement with the protocol. I think so far the Good Friday Agreement has won all its matches. It's survived. It's now reinforced by the withdrawal agreement. It's, the Good Friday Agreement is protected in all its parts, even if the UK is not working the British and Irish Intergovernmental Conference. That's the nominal form of textual agreement. Other treaties have been less successful in European history. 
We're now faced, I think, with the complex interaction of the mess created by the trade and cooperation agreement and its interaction with the protocol. And the interaction of all of these things with an insecure and poorly led unionist community means that we are faced with potential institutional collapse. I did not say civil war. I did not say large scale violence. I said potential widespread institutional collapse. And on that cheerful note, I will bring myself to a conclusion. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Brendan. Um, so if the hosts could just enable the chat again, I would invite the audience, if they have any questions for Professor O'Leary, to pop them in the chat and I can put them to him. Um, just to let, us know, to let you know if there are questions, um, Sarah has kindly given me permission to run a little few minutes over for this session, but the next session does need to start at 11.15 sharp, so that will mean that our break is a little shorter. Um, alternatively, if you'd rather um, put the question to Professor O'Leary yourself, please raise your hand and I can call on you. Um, and while we're waiting, I'll do what Brenda did in the previous session and abuse um, my position of, as host um, by putting a question to Brendan, um, which is a little off topic on what he spoke about, but something that I think we'd be interested to hear what he has to say about. And um, so you mentioned potential unification of the um, reunification of Ireland. Um, and I know that you've been involved in work that looks at um, what order referendums would happen in and where dialogue would happen in relation to those referendums to allow that to be a smoother process as possible. And so I'm wondering if you would say a few words about that. I, I am indeed part of a project led by the University of College London on planning for referendums on unification on the island of Ireland. An interim report has been published. Your views are very welcome. We will be finalizing the final report before too long. I don't want to try and summarize a 237 page report in two or three sentences. And I don't want to pretend that the group is absolutely agreed on everything. What I can say is that uh, my view is held by many in the group, namely that preparation is required, particularly in the Republic of Ireland, even though the prospect of referendums is not imminent. The Republic of Ireland could be faced with the possibility of an irresponsible Secretary of State calling a, a premature referendum without sufficient support. It could find itself faced with a referendum being called, which succeeds in the North, but with completely inadequate preparation in the South. So it's my personal view that the that though it's correct to pursue good neighbourly relations with Northern Ireland, absolutely correct to pursue the stabilisation of the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement, it's absolutely correct to emphasise all the pieties and the suspects of the shared island um, agenda. It's also equally important to prepare for the possibility of referendums on Irish unification. And the amount of preparation that would involve would be extraordinary. It's not some uh, paper exercise. If the Good Friday Agreement is a text of roughly 30 pages, uh, that text that would be required before referendums on Irish unification would be somewhere between 650 and 1,000 pages for those who are so minded to read it. So the amount of work involved to prepare for various models of Irish unification to decide which one the South prefers, or if the South instead prefers a model of uh, an all island constitutional convention, whatever it decides involves extraordinary hard work. But you have, Dawn, absolutely ignored my talk and taken us down another direction. Um, I welcome any questions on what I just said. Of course, um, and we have one on what I just on what you spoke about more directly, and then one that probably does follow up uh, more on the question I put to you. So the first is from Angus, and it's, um, does Her Majesty go uh, Majesty's government's attitude to treaty responsibilities have anything to do with their unwritten constitution, which doesn't seem to constrain an individual government if it doesn't want to be constrained? Um, and the next is from Taylor Hinch is if. 
if there was to be a united Ireland, do you envisage the maintenance of devolved power to Northern Ireland or a single government in Dublin? Both very good questions. On the first, Perfidious Albion is not uh, the result of English national character traits. It's a constitutional condition. If you don't have a codified constitution, one in which uh, respect for international treaties is built in, then you do precisely have the institutional difficulties that the UK has got itself into. Through uh, winner takes all, uh, electing single in, in single member districts, you can get radical shifts in power and position inside the House of Commons, not reflecting authentic majorities. And if those uh, who hold parliamentary power can uh, hold referendums irresponsibly, overturning uh, 40 years of uh, treaty cooperation without proper planning or consideration, that really is a, a dangerous constitutional and institutional condition to be in. And your, the premise of your question, Angus, is correct. It's, it's not because the UK constitution is unwritten, it's, it's because it's uncodified. It, it does have one principle, and only one, namely that uh, Parliament decides. Uh, and that, that decision <laughs> fits very curiously with the people shall decide in a referendum, but it creates that uh, enormous potential institutional instability, both domestically and in terms of relations with its international part partners. No other European polity could have politicians standing up in their legislature openly saying that they intend to break international law in the drafting of their legislation. It would be ruled out of order. So that is a very, uh, a very continuing English peculiarity. And I mean English because these are institutional arrangements that stem from English dominance inside the Union. The second question is equally important. If there was to be a United Ireland, do you envisage the maintenance of uh, devolved power sharing to Northern Ireland? I think that's the most fundamental question that both Northerners have to ask themselves and Southerners about their future. If they are to unify, do they unify under an integrated model in which Northern Ireland is dissolved? but there are other special arrangements put in place to deal with the profound interests, identities, and concerns of British Protestants and those who don't identify as uh, Irish nationalists. Or is Northern Ireland preserved? And if it is preserved, is it preserved with its existing consociational arrangements or are those modified? Now, John, Gary, and I conducted an experiment on this question. We, we had a sample of the Northern Irish population. We gave them an account of, we said, look, we don't think Irish unification is imminent, but if it were to happen, we think these are the two likely scenarios. One is an integrated Northern Ireland in which Northern Ireland, sorry, an integrated Ireland in which Northern Ireland would be dissolved. And the other is a, a Northern Ireland which is devolved inside the United Ireland. And we gave them as objective as possible descriptions of how each would function. Initially, as we expected, Protestants favoured the maintenance of Northern Ireland inside a united Ireland. But then we went into some of the difficulties that would be attached to each model. And what was interesting to us was that it was Protestants who changed their minds. And as far as we could tell, we, we have transcripts, we see what was being discussed among groups. Two things mattered to them. First of all, they didn't think the power sharing institutions in Northern Ireland were working very well anyway. That could have been a, a function of when we had our deliberative forum. And therefore, why would they work any better inside a United Ireland? And secondly, some of them worked out we had clearly indicated to them that Protestants as a whole would compose one sixth of Doyle Aaron uh, of Irish institutions. And therefore, they would be likely regular pivotal players in possible Irish coalitions. So if you think about it strategically, 
if there were ever a vote for Irish unification in the North, unionists would be faced with the, the question, would we like to continue to remain as a new minority in Northern Ireland, inside the United Ireland, or would we rather take our institutional chances inside uh, an integrated Ireland? I can't make that decision for them, nor can anybody who is of uh, either an other tradition or from the nationalist tradition. But debating that uh, institutional option and debating its possible consequences is, I think, an important part of the preparation that is required in the period ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Brendan. Um, we do have a few more questions, but I'm afraid uh, I think we need to leave it there to allow people to have a short break before the next session. Um, however, I do think that the questions that are coming up will continue to be relevant in the next two sessions as well. So uh, do feel free uh, to put them to our remaining speakers. So just thank you again, Brendan, for taking the time to talk to us um, and for such an engaging presentation. Thank you. I'll hand back over to Sarah.